What if there were errors in your Bible? What if intentional changes were made? Would you want to know the truth? Would you want the Bible to be corrected from corruption? Many of these corruptions of scripture are, in Genesis. Let's talk about the genealogy of Genesis. Specifically, let's look at Genesis 10.24. Genesis 10.24, and Arphaxat begat Salah, and Salah begat Heber. Now, Take a look, juxtaposed to the older Septuagint version of Genesis 10.24. Genesis 10.24, Septuagint, and Arphaxat begat Canaan, and Canaan begat Salah and Salah begat Heber. There used to be an extra generation in Genesis 10.24. The generation of Canaan, also known as the controversial second Canaan of Genesis. Even though he is missing in most Bibles with the New Testament. He does appear once in the genealogy of Luke, in the New Testament. Luke 3.36, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxat, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech. I trust the genealogy of Luke for one main reason. Luke lists 77 generations from Adam to Jesus. This is the same number of generations that the book of Enoch said would be. From Adam, to the Son of Man. I also trust that there should be 24 generations in Genesis, from Adam to Joseph. Clearly the Genesis story canonized Adam, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, and last is the story of Joseph, the last to clearly receive a birthright from his father. Without the second Canaan, in Genesis 10:24, there is only 23 generations from Adam to Joseph. I believe there must be 24 generations of birthright, handed down from Adam to Joseph. Why am I sure? Because it clearly says in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, that there are 24 elders. Revelation 4:4, 4, 4, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats, I saw four and twenty elders sitting. Who are the oldest people in the Bible? The twenty-four generations of Genesis from Adam to Joseph. The twenty-four elders. When second Canaan is placed back into the genealogy of Genesis, he is the thirteenth generation. The thirteenth letter of any Semitic language, is also the numeric denomination of forty. The first ten letters are one through ten. Then the eleventh is twenty, the twelfth is thirty, and the thirteenth is forty. The original thirteenth letter of the pictograph alphabet, was removed. This was originally, a pictograph of a hammer. The sound of the letter was da, 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 like the sound of a hammer striking iron upon an anvil. Was the letter removed at the same time as Second Canaan was removed? I believe they were removed at the same time. The reason? The name Canaan means, the smith, as in blacksmith, or iron forger. This trade matches the original pictograph of the missing letter. The hammer pictograph, and it matches the sound of the missing letter. Da, da, da. I don't think that this is a coincidence. This looks related, and intentional. The Hebrew alphabet only has 22 letters. And only 22 denominations 1 through 10. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 200, 300 and 400. The alphabet is missing two letters, for the denominations 500 and 1000. It makes no sense for the original alphabet to end with the denomination of 400. Who would do that? 
If you place the missing hammer pictograph letter back as the 13th letter, it then has its original place as the denomination of 40. This shifts the letter mim to the denomination of 50, and every letter after shifts down. This makes the last Hebrew letter daf, now the denomination of 500. With 23 letters, the denominations are completed to 500. This makes much more sense, especially with the hammer as 40. Considering how the number 40 is used through the Bible. The earth was smitten with 40 days of rain with a flood, and all life was judged. The Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, because they were smitten, and judged unworthy. Jesus wandered into the wilderness for 40 days and fasted. God was making him, and humbling him for divinity. When Rachel's handmaid had her first child Dan, with Jacob, she declared, God had given her a judgment for a son. The child's name being Dan, as, Dan, which means judgment or judge. It seems clear that the number 40 is used to mean judgment or to be smitten. This makes better sense with the hammer pictograph as the denomination of 40. The Hebrew letter man was originally a pictograph of waves of water. This makes better sense as the denomination of 50, 50 being a jubilee of years associated with the passing waves of time. There is also a 24th letter that was removed from the Hebrew alphabet. But it is not really a missing letter. It can be found in older versions of Paleo Hebrew. This 24th letter is the letter Gayan, or, Ga. It has always had the denomination of 1000. With all 24 letters, the denominations are completed to 1000, adding 500 and 1000. When the letter Da was removed, the sound of the letter was combined with the fourth letter, De. This then turned the fourth Hebrew letter from De, which means sky and is where we get the English word day, from, into. The new Hebrew letter, Dale. Then, when the letter Gai N was removed, it was combined with the third Hebrew letter Gem. This letter originally having the J sound, instead of the Ga sound. This then formed the new Hebrew letter Gamel, as the third letter. Having only the Ga sound, the J sound was dropped. This is how Hebrew lost its hammer pictograph, and how it lost its J sound and letter. The 24th pictograph letter, Gayan, was originally a pictograph of two ropes intertwined together. This letter means to intertwine two together, to make them a stronger, one, to make rope from twine. I believe these changes were made to hide the full genealogy of Canaan, the 13th generation. Also, to hide and change words associated with the da sound, and with the j sound. This also hiding a part of God's true nature, his judgment and discipline nature as a true father. The original pictograph of the third letter gem, was a pictograph of a foot. The original meaning of this pictograph letter was, three that gathered to walk together. The name Jesus insinuates three Zeus or Zeus, that gathered to walk together. The original gem pictograph letter was the original symbol for a trinity that walks together. This is the original letter used to spell the name Jebus and the Jebusites, in the Genesis story. The Jebusites being the first to settle in Jerusalem after the flood story in Genesis. Now let's talk about the genealogy of Canaan, aside from his known son Salah, or Shelah. First, 
Let's look at the genealogy in the book, The Cave of Treasures. This book is based on the doctrine of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. The Church claims that their doctrine is the original that came directly from Solomon. Here is a portion of the genealogy of Canaan, from their doctrine book. This paragraph concerns the body of Adam, which was taken from the cave and placed upon the ark by Noah and his sons before the flood. As you see, in this one paragraph, it says Malak, the son of Canaan and brother of Salah or Shelah. It then also says, Malak is the father of Melchizedek and his mother is Yozadak. It then becomes clear, why the genealogy of Canaan was removed from the Genesis story. Now, let's take a look at Hebrews 7.2 and then Hebrews 7.3, about Melchizedek. This is referencing Abraham giving a tenth of his spoils of war to Melchizedek, in the Genesis story. This is referencing that Melchizedek has no father or mother, and is without genealogy or origin. I find the contradictions of these two doctrines to be highly suspicious. I do not believe for one minute that Melchizedek did not have any genealogy. I don't think that is possible. Even Jesus has genealogy. I think it is suspicious to make a point to say that Melchizedek has no genealogy. I think this is an intentional cover-up of both of the parents of Melchizedek. Now let's talk about the parents of Melchizedek, Malak and Yozadak. The name Malak is where we get the Semitic word for king. Also, the word Malakim. The Semitic word Malakim is interpreted in English as meaning the word angel. Malak himself is king of the Malakim, or king of the angels or angelus. He is called the Angel of the Lord in Genesis, which was referred to as Moloch Yahweh, in original Semitic. Moloch was born to be the ambassador of God upon the earth, because he is the seventh from Enoch, fourteenth from Adam. Abraham was the twenty-first from Adam, and the seventh from Moloch bin Canaan. It is Moloch who comes to Abraham with two Molochim, to give prophecy for his future son Isaac. This just before Moloch and his two Molochim go to pass judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. The two Molochim go to Sodom, as scripture says. Moloch goes to Gomorrah. This is not in the Genesis scripture. This is why his son Melchizedek, is made priest of the Most High God. Melchizedek is also made to be the helpmate of God. I also believe that Melchizedek is the Holy Spirit. And that Malak and Melchizedek, and Jesus, make the Trinity upon the earth. His mother, Yozadak, is where the name Zadak, or Zadok, comes from. Melchizedek being the first priest of the Zadok priesthood of God. There is one more thing about Melchizedek that may shock you. There is evidence that Melchizedek may have been a hermaphrodite. This because the word Melchi means queen. The word Melok means king, and also because. I believe his parents, Moloch and Yozadak, are the same as Hermes and Aphrodite. Let's talk about other changes that were made to the Genesis genealogy and timeline. Specifically, the ages at which each generation of birthright begat the next generation. Let's take a look at the King James Biblical genealogy timeline of Genesis. Here we see the begat age, the years lived, and the birth and death years from Adam. 
Now let's take a look juxtaposed to the older version from the writings of Josephus, the chronicler. Josephus lived around the time of Christ and was an ancient history recorder. His writings are available in a modern book now. When they are juxtaposed, you can see that 600 years has been removed from the year length of the timeline. The begat year of age has been reduced by 100 years on each of six of the birthright generations of Genesis. The older Septuagint version of Genesis also matches the writings of Josephus on this timeline. Now we can also add in the BC year date on each, if we have the beginning year. I believe the beginning year of Adam's creation or birth is hidden in the name of God, the Tetragrammaton of Yahweh. I believe the year date is plainly hidden in the numbers of the Tetragrammaton name. Let me show you what I mean. Here is a picture of the Tetragrammaton name in Paleosemitic. The Tetragrammaton is read from right to left but the numeric values are normally read from left to right. Here is a key of the first ten letters of the pictograph alphabet as a reference. These are the paleosomatic pictographs and their values, 1 through 10. There are two year dates that are easily seen in the numbers of the tetragrammaton. They are 5650 BC and 10565 BC, one left to right, the other right to left. Here is the tetragrammaton name twice, with both values given, and their purpose. As you can see, they are referred to as Adam's birth year and the beginning year of the age of Leo. If we use the year 5650 BC as the beginning year in a fully corrected timeline, it appears to fit perfectly with chronological and historically recorded history. Let's take a look at the fully corrected timeline with the BC year date added with the timeline. The BC year dates appear on the far right beginning with 5650 BC. As you see, the longer timeline fits better with the beginning year given in the Tetragrammaton. Now let's take a look at the remaining genealogy timeline of Genesis. First, let's look at the timeline of the King James Version Bible. This is the Patriarch genealogy list after the Flood, from Shem to Joseph. As you see, Canaan has been omitted from the genealogy timeline. Now let's take a look juxtaposed to the older Septuagint version of Genesis. Here you see that Canaan was originally in the timeline, as the 13th generation. As you see, almost 900 years has been removed from the second half of the Genesis genealogy. This including the years removed with the entire generation of Canaan. I believe there are some other minor scribing errors in the Septuagint version also. But they are minor, and I do not want to go into the particulars of their becoming. With much research, I have been able to remove all of these minor errors also. Now let's take a look at the fully corrected timeline, with the BC years added in also. There is one more minor error that I am investigating in the years lived of one patriarch, but this will make no difference in the BC year dates. As you see, this place is the year of the Great Flood 
or deluge, as the year 3394 BC. This year date fits much better with what we know about ancient recorded history and archaeology. The corrected Genesis timeline then ends with the birth of Joseph, in the year 2021 BC. This year date of 2021 BC, is very near to the beginning year of the age of Aries. This also being the same as the end of the age of Taurus. This being the age that began with Enoch. I believe these timeline changes were made to hide the fact that Jesus was, and is, the Messiah. This because the Pharisees did notice that Jesus did come, at the right time. 5,650 years from the birth of Adam. Just like the Tetragrammaton had always illustrated. By shortening the timeline they could then argue that 5,650 years had not yet passed since Adam's creation. With this, they could then argue that Jesus was not the Messiah, and that they had not killed Messiah, but an imposter. So it came that another timeline was created and then eventually, the Jewish Masoretic text was born. This then becoming the text that was used to make most all Bibles in the world. I would like to mention here also that the number 5650 is exactly 113 jubilees. A jubilee is 50 years. Exactly 113, 50 year periods. Now, what do you think? Does this make sense to you? Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. Check out the book series, The 24 Elders and a Little Scroll. Here is the link. Thanks again.